Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tech Summit Podcast, Episode 5. I'm Chris. I'm Francisco. Just remember, everyone, to follow the social media that you will see right over here. If everyone's trying to figure out still who I am, don't worry. My social media will be there shortly. (laughs) So today we have two subjects to discuss today. All right. We're going to start off with the uh, start with the, 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 you know, recent past. And that is the launch of the iPhone 12 and also some of the issues that have been propping up more recently when it comes to the right to repair and um, environmental concerns, quote unquote, but uh, first off, we have to uh, acknowledge the elephant in the room. Uh, one of us has an iPhone 12. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So Francisco here has the iPhone 12. Um, his first impressions and reviews should be coming up relatively soon. Yes? Within the week, I would say, yeah. All right. So just to get us started a little bit, though, you know, give us a little bit of a sneak peek. What exactly are your thoughts on the iPhone 12? My thoughts on this are, quite frankly, that this is just my favorite iPhone of all time. Really? Yes. It's a very bold. It is indeed <laughs> quite bold. But the reasons for that is because, well, I, I would say that seven years ago, uh, when the iPhone 5S came out, I thought, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. It's mm-hmm. got the most beautiful design because it's so boxy, it's so tiny, and it's so nice, and the camera is it, just so great by 2013 standards. And then we get to uh to 2020 and ever since the iphone 5 s we haven't seen that boxy design on iphones uh and the the last time before this that we saw it was with the ipad pro so while i really love that design on the ipad pro i was really missing it on on an iphone and i'm so glad to actually have that here this phone aside from being a beautiful design and it being a lot nicer to hold also has one of the nicest cameras that I have ever seen on a smartphone. Like, even though it does max out at 4K at 60 frames per second, I do generally shoot at 24, and that is another point of discussion. 24 versus 30, that is another very controversial topic. But (laughs) um, when it comes to 24 frames per second in 4K, this this camera really nails it. And you can even do ultra-wide in 4K. Like, it's just great. Though I tend to not shoot an ultra wide, I, I tend to shoot just with like the standard focal length and it's incredibly sharp. The colors are really on point. Autofocus is great. Electronic image stabilization is awesome. Like the cameras, they definitely nailed it when it comes to the rear facing cameras and the front facing camera that admittedly I don't really use all that much because I'm so mesmerized by the rear facing cameras and I really like recording other things. And not to mention that for the first time, on the budget version of an iPhone, we actually get a high-resolution OLED screen. When we used to be stuck with a 720p screen, even uh, all the way up to the iPhone 11, which has uh, a 750p screen, like around there. At, Very interesting I, I choice. That's a arbitrary number, but okay. Yeah, I, uh, it is usually because of, of uh, the aspect ratio, um, but yeah, like... Apple has always had really low resolution screens on their budget phones. Um, And that dates all the way back since, I mean, I mean, God knows when, Uh, like when did, did Apple start implementing that like lower budget and then like the two uh, higher budget phones, like for instance, like the original SE or well, more like, uh, uh, like the iPhone uh, 11 than the 11 pro and 11 pro max. I mean, okay. Yeah, so, like, we've always seen a 720p screen on the cheaper models. And now, finally, on an $800 phone, and I think that this also applies to the iPhone 12 mini, you get uh, what is essentially a 1440p screen. I don't remember the exact... No, no wait, I do remember them. They're 1170 by 2530. Uh, so, yeah, this is a very high-resolution screen. It's an OLED screen, no longer... LCD, which, you know, thank God. And I never thought that I would see that on what is technically the budget version of the iPhone, but this is still an $800 phone. It's not cheap. So you're very impressed with the phone. Um, So I I, I guess we're going to, in the dynamic between the two of us, I guess we're going to say that you're not necessarily pro Apple, but pro iPhone 12. Yes. (laughs) Okay. I get to be the opposition today. There you go. (laughs) Because, uh, Okay, maybe not necessarily anti-iPhone 12, but I'm definitely anti-Apple at mm-hmm. the current moment. Um, 
I don't have an iPhone 12. Um, my experience with the iPhone 12 came down to my other friend who had the uh, who showed me the um, the Pro models uh, little scanner thing that sort of scans things into like 3D polygonal objects, and mm-hmm. then you can export those as OBJ files. Um, which you know looked really rough, but I feel like with the smaller object, more, like we were trying to do it with like subway benches. It, <laughs> it was it was obviously going to be a little rough, but with a smaller object, it probably works out and. You know, then you could probably bring it into like a 3D modeling software and like retopologize it or something. You know, mm-hmm. um, which you know is really cool and also really terrifying because if that advances over uh, the next couple of years, I could be out of a job. Um, and uh, <laughs> what's it called? Um, so you know, my my last phone from Apple was an iPhone 6s, right. which I held on to for three years until that battery was shot to hell. And then I uh, transitioned over to uh, Google Pixel 3a. Um, But the point is, um, so there's a lot of problems surrounding the iPhone 12 at the current moment. Uh, You know, a lot of it is proprietary stuff. Like, okay, so one of the biggest news pieces for the last couple of weeks as the iPhone 12 was launching was the lack of a charging brick included. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason why Apple states, the reason Apple states is that, you know, they're trying to be environmentally conscious because everyone has charging bricks. So why include another one? Why use all that plastic up? The problem is, <laughs> the problem is for as many charging bricks that we have in our households, none of them support the wire for the iPhone 12. That is completely true, yes. In order to charge your iPhone 12 with a charging brick, you need to buy one separately from Apple themselves. Yes. So at that point, it stops looking like trying to protect the environment by not including a charging brick mm-hmm. and more just not choo- uh, you know, including a charging brick so that way you can charge it separately. And as someone who actually cares about the environment a lot, it's actually really infuriating to me to see you know, a good cause be used as an excuse just to charge people more money. You know? Yeah, uh, it's it, it's definitely not the first time that they do this. Mm-hmm. I mean, what Apple does is that they give you a problem and then they show you the solution. They charge you for the solution. Yes, they charge you extra they for the solution. For, and how much are those charging bricks? Those charging bricks, I I I think that they're about thirty bucks. Uh, <laughs> like it, it is a lot for just a charging brick. It's a lot for a charging brick. <laughs> yeah, you have thirty dollar charging bricks. You had the one thousand dollar display stand for your monitor. Um, <laughs> of course, Apple has I'm saving become, up for that one. <laughs> Apple has become the king of like chopping things out of a product and giving it to you separately, and sort of conditioning people to sort of believe that that's just supposed to be the norm. Remember, mm-hmm. they were the first ones to remove a headphone jack, um, and they gave us AirPods, and they gave you AirPods, and now a lot of other phone manufacturers don't include headphone jacks anymore, to mm-hmm. the point where including a headphone jack is actually considered a feature. Yeah. Um, so uh, I. <laughs> it's dread... something that does get celebrated. So now I'm kind of dreading two years from now when no phone comes with a charging brick, and like none of the charging bricks you already have can support, so you have to buy them separately. That just seems like mm-hmm. a thing that's gonna happen. I mean, third party charging bricks are gonna like shoot through the roof when it comes to sales. Uh, good, yeah. Good for them, I guess. But yeah, for sure. Um, I think that uh, the primary issue here is yes, uh, most people do not have a USB C charging brick. Um, never mind a fast charger, which is also supposed to be one of the features of the iPhone 12, even though fast charging has, has been a thing for a long time, even with iPhones. Um, I would still say that because not so like hardly anybody that I know for sure, um, has, uh, USB-C just like all over their house. Uh, like it's going to be tough for them to not end up buying a charging brick with that phone. And as I'm going to mention in my review, uh, you're like when you buy the iPhone 12, you're probably not just going to buy the iPhone 12. You're most likely going to buy other things as well. Besides your usual screen protector and case, this time you're going to have to buy a charging brick. Probably you might be looking at their what is potentially uh, their vision of the future way of a uh, of the all phones are going to be charged through wireless charging, so in this case, MagSafe, uh, and probably end up buying into that as well. Like, when you buy the iPhone 12 now, you're no longer ju- ju- just buying a phone. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, like 
this particular choice would have made a little bit more sense in like the iPhone 13 or 14 if they decided to skip 13 because of superstition. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's entirely possible that they do that. Um, you know, certainly it's going to get memed to death if they announce an iPhone 13. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Um, like it would have made more sense if they introduced this particular policy then, like after we've already gotten established two charging bricks with USB C ports. Um but the fact that is that this is the first phone, to my knowledge, this is the first phone that uh uses USB C charging from Apple, right? On the other end, actually, um the new twenty twenty iPhone SE had the other end be USB C. However, the charging brick that came in the box was USB A. <laughs> <laughs> on the bright side though the ipad pro uh comes with the USB-C on, on both ends oh man and the charging brick for that one does feature USB-C. so hey golly you... gee just bundle up get, get an iphone 12 <laughs> and the ipad <laughs> yeah there you go and you only need one charging brick you know, apple only... is incredibly generous it'll Jesus. only cost you three of your fingers <laughs> 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 It's an odd number. I'm not sure how, how I feel about that. So speaking of superstitions. <laughs> so, uh, what's it called? <laughs> um, so, okay. So let's ignore the issue of the uh, charging brick because that one's been discussed a good bit. Uh, I don't think anybody's happy with that one. Let's talk about something else that's recently come up that uh, a lot of people aren't very happy with. So YouTuber Hugh Jeffries, we're going to cite our sources on this one here. Hugh Jeffries bought two different iPhone 12s. Same model, same make, different color. One of them was blue, the other one was red. But I knew it. Two iPhone 12s, um, because you know there's not many, you know, there's not many aftermarket parts. So he op- he gets two iPhone 12s just to test the repairability of these phones. He takes the exact same phone, and he swaps the parts over, and the phones are glitching out. They're riddled with bugs. There's all kinds of problems. And the conclusion that he's coming with, and a lot of people are coming with, is that um, the only way you can ensure, you know, a completely problem, like problem-free repairing of your phone is to get it sent directly to an Apple store, to an Apple manufacturing, or, you know, like a genius bar, whatever it may be. The only way you can repair your phone is directly through Apple. If you try to do it with third-party parts, if you try to do it with first-party parts from a you know local mom pa shop, you will run into many problems trying to. Like, it basically, it's another instance of it's sort of an attack on the right to repairing, you know, and the sort of planned obsolescence debate that we've been having for several years now, actually, mm-hmm. um, and. I personally think it's really insidious. Um, you know, once you get a product, you should be able to do what you want with it. We've discussed this in the first episode, you know, with the whole Oculus Facebook thing. Yeah. Uh, and now we're talking about the possibility that the only way you can repair your phone is to do it through Apple, which obviously Apple is going to charge you a hell of a lot more than anybody else would. Yes. Especially if they're the only option in town, you know. Yeah. Um, so this reminds me a lot, actually, of a different issue that people we're having back when uh when iPhones used to have fingerprint scanners mm. is that if you tried to get your phone uh like the screen replaced in any shop that wasn't an Apple store, mm. uh your fingerprint scanner was just disabled and you couldn't use it anymore. And and sometimes if, if you were actually using uh a more recent iPhone, like let's say the seven or the eight that does still have a home button, but instead of it being a physical button, it was a haptic uh, button. So like it, it only presses down or I should say that it, it, it really only works if the phone is already turned on. In other words, uh, for those people, a lo- I do know of a lot of people that simply could not use the home button anymore. Like the software just wasn't responding to it anymore because it wasn't the hardware uh, button it was it was actually just a little indentation that worked over software uh, with a little sensor underneath so this reminds me a lot of this uh, issue with like the cameras being swapped over though I'm going to bring this up yeah and I this is just pure speculation but you did mention uh, that these two were two different colors and I wonder if somehow. <laughs> 
it would have resulted differently if they had both been the same color. But this, that's unlikely. This is, <laughs> this is iPhone, not Pokemon. <laughs> like the slight differences from the colors is what's going to cause problems. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, man. These are, these are parts from iPhone red, not iPhone blue. This, sorry, we got to shut down the phone now. <laughs> no, yeah. Like it's just a different ribbon cable. Sorry. No, no. It, I, I, I do not think that's going to be the issue at all. I don't think um, so either. For the fact, we are we are going to uh, we are going to link the video in the description of the vi- of uh, this podcast just so mm-hmm. that way people can uh, have a look at it and see for themselves what yes. the whole deal is. Um, you know, links will be down in the description. But like, I just think that's a really insidious thing because basically, uh, it's presu- presumably this is a sort of like a computer programming type of thing where it's like you are sort of going with a computer and programming the parts to be compatible with this specific model. You know, mm-hmm. um, and this isn't a completely unheard of thing in the world of technology, maybe for phones. Sure. I don't remember if I heard any other phone companies doing this. You know, Apple's innovating here, I guess. Uh, I mean, Samsung has had some controversy, really? too. Yeah. Samsung's uh, done this, too. Yes. Um, I can't uh, think off the top of my head uh, of, uh, of anything in particular that has happened recently. So the thing that I was going to specifically note was BMW, auto, you know, in, in the automotive industry, how BMW uses computers to program certain parts or whatever to work with, you know, that particular car. Um, and so it's a similar deal with what's happening here with the iPhone 12, presumably. Um, just because it's like, I don't know, like, so story time. A couple of years ago, a uh, couple of years ago, uh, my 6S screen shattered. And it shattered in a way where it like kept registering presses on the screen so like my you know it kept tapping basically and trying to enter a passcode until the phone locked gotcha. permanently like a permanent lock the entire phone was completely inaccessible from that forward on the only way mm-hmm. you can deal with it is with full-on hard factory reset yeah um so i had to get the screen repaired um and you know i went to a local shop in my neighborhood uh technically an authorized retail you know what i mean i didn't go to the apple store i didn't go to a jeans store because i know it's going to cost a lot more money over there especially because it is an older phone Mm -hmm. you know by the time we were dealing with this iphone x was already on the market so we're talking several years after the 6s should have already been like out of the picture Mm -hmm. um and so i got my my, you know my phone repaired over there and it was a lot cheaper i think it was like 70 80 bucks yeah 70 80 bucks yeah that Um, sounds about right you know, just for a third mar- for a third party uh, screen repair. Even though they were like authorized by Apple. I'm trying to remember. I mean, it's not like some local back alley place. You know, you <laughs> want to fix your phone, uh, like yeah, n- n- none of that. But, um, like it, it just wasn't actual Apple. Yeah. So like, but we we repair the screen, and you know, obviously I had issues after the fact. Um, mm-hmm. and you know. Apple Store claims, oh, it's because it was a third-party person. You know, you should probably replace it with a thing. It's going to cost you this. this and mm-hmm. no. Um, and, you know, the people who actually repaired the phone, they sort of uh, said that it's be- – because the thing, the specific issue that I was running into is that during cold weather – so, like, say, for example, right now, during the cold weather, um, if I left my phone out or whatever and I turned off the screen, I try to turn it back on, the screen will become unresponsive. And the reason cited from the people who repaired the screen is that it comes down to an issue with the internals of the phone itself, um, like the CPU or whatever it may be. Uh, it could have been. Um, I, I'm not sure what it is. Like, I don't think mm-hmm. they were trying to excuse for the shot. Well, they, they might have been trying to excuse for the shoddy work, but whatever it may have been, um, it was a really annoying issue. Uh, I'm trying to remember where I was going with this. But the fact of the matter is, um, <laughs> <laughs> the fact of the matter is, for a screen repair at a third-party shop, that suddenly ends up becoming a complete non-issue. And, you know, while I ran into issues in the cold, I didn't have those kind of problems, you know, in, like, the spring or the summer or whatever Mm -hmm. it may be. Um, We're talking here now an actual malicious intent of, like, throwing in glitches and bugs into the hardware because the hardware that you use for reparations is not apple authorized even if it is from another iphone Mm -hmm. like we're not even talking about a third party made in taiwan piece or an actual iphone part Mm -hmm. being put into the iphone and it still spits out issues at you 
Um, you know, obviously people are saying glitches and bugs, but in reality, you know, if it's programmed to do that, that's malware. Like that is forcefully being implemented and that's malware. Yeah, like it's a, it is, it is indeed a hardware issue at that point. Like, uh, and also, well, I mean, in software, but uh, there is a link between the two here where the hardware is causing uh, the software issues. And I want, I do wonder though, uh, if maybe if it, uh, if it was a camera that was built specifically to be a replacement piece, I wonder if that would have actually changed the entire story, um, if that would have made a difference or not. But either way, what happened is so pretty ridiculous. The fact that you can't just swap parts around. And it's not like like the piece was even damaged to begin with. He bought two just to check on the Fresh repairability. New. Fresh new iPhones. Yeah. Nothing, nothing damaged. He didn't slam it on the floor or anything like that. Yeah. It wasn't playing hacky sack. It was a fresh new iPhone, two new iPhones whose parts were just swapped over. And yeah, so this brings mm -hmm. up sort of a fear and concern about the right to uh, repair in the future. You know, obviously yeah. Apple's kind of been trying to fight that little battle for a while. And it seems like this could very well be the death knell. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. You know, time to throw in the towel. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I do know that Apple has been very aggressive when it comes to uh, the right to repair. Um, and things like that. And uh, they actually did have their own program where you could get authorized uh, to become an Apple repair shop or, uh, or authorized to receive parts from them. However, uh, there is this other YouTuber called uh, Louis Rossman who owns a, a repair shop here in New York. Mm. His shop, um, and funnily enough, was actually right across the street from our school. Really? Yeah. Uh, he without doxing, <laughs> yeah, yes, without doxing. Um, but uh, his his take on this essentially is that uh, this is something that he has been fighting for a very long time, um, as well, and it's something that he's been dealing with for a long time. And even if he did become an authorized uh repair shop, uh, there is still an expense to be made, uh, like after you become a verified uh repair shop that you still have to pay uh to stay in in the program and then and oftentimes it ends up being more expensive to be part of the program or at the very least not worth it because you still have is have issues getting parts at the very least like this is what i gathered that if unless you are apple or unless you are part of the genius bar you simply cannot fix an iphone I mean, you cannot take it to any place that's not the Apple store at this time. And, and I think that that is absolutely egregious. And of course, you know, you mentioned that, you know, he has to pay in order to stay in that program to get those parts. Obviously, that's going to mean that it's going to, that he has to raise the cost of repairing an iPhone, even to those people who, when he's outside the Apple network. So no matter which way you slice or dice it, things like this only raise the prices further up. Mm -hmm. This is basically Apple's attempt at controlling that sort of market and being allowed, you know, sort of becoming the only option for a lot of people. And, you know, mm -hmm. that just sort of, I don't know. It's, it's like, it feels like another instance of sort of being trapped into Apple's ecosystem, you know. As we all know, uh, iPhones are notoriously very closed off compared to, say, for example, the customizability of, like, an Android or whatever it may be. You mean when it comes to the software? Yeah, when it comes to software, when it comes to the fact that you have to, like, you know, you have to use iTunes or Apple Music or Apple Podcasts, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You have to use the iCloud. You know, there's a lot less... There's a lot less customizability and, fun and, and stuff that you can do with these things as you can with, like, an Android phone or whatever. Um, and the biggest complaint of, uh, regarding that is actually the fact that you cannot position uh, your widgets and your buttons to be wherever you want them on screen. It's always following one order. <laughs> really? Really? Is yeah. that how it is now? No, yeah, seriously. Uh, well, I mean, it's always been that way. Um, uh, on I, the iPhone, like I can actually show you right now even. Am I a little confused here? Uh, so on Android, for instance, I can have icons wherever I want, right? So like I do have just icons on the bottom. Yeah. And on the iPhone, on the other hand, I can't do that. I have to have all of them uh, kind of following just one pattern. As you can see, they're all just right next to each other. And uh, the only way that I can split that pattern is if I actually just go to the next page. 
Okay, I see what you mean now. Yeah, and do that. And uh, that's like one major complaint that people have had about the software for a long time. Right. And that's one thing that actually speaks volumes about the, the customization aspect when it comes to Android versus iPhone. Because, hey, I mean, while now on iPhone you can't actually have widgets and things like that, uh, it's just better than what we had before, which was that we had, uh, I, I think, widgets in like a separate window. Like, it's still not the same as Android, um, right. as you were saying. Like, the customization as aspect is just way better on Android, and yeah, this is just one example. No, yeah, so, like, that's the thing. Like for the longest time, we've always kind of had this sort of feeling where it's, like, Apple very much tries to confine you into Apple's products and their services. You know, it's our way or the highway when it comes to the software, and now we can see that creeping in with the hardware aspect where now we're leading ourselves down a path where the only way you can get your phone repaired is through Apple themselves. Even if you're doing it through a third party who mm -hmm. is licensed by Apple, in the end, it's still going back to Apple. And if Apple isn't setting the prices, then they're going to set the prices on that third party person high enough to where they have to set their prices higher to match for it. So like, no matter what, you're paying more. Yes. Um, either way, you are still uh, getting screwed as a small business owner. Yeah. And... That's unacceptable, especially during the current climate. Uh, uh, yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, we're talking about the higher costs and prices, mm -hmm. plus your $30 charging brick. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It all just ties back together. Plus your AirPods, because you can't, you know, because there's no headphone jack, so you got to get. Uh, one issue uh, that really hits hard is that, like, when it comes to just not being able to just purchase one product. You have to go with, uh, with ha having to purchase other accessories to really make. I don't even want to say just make the most out of your phone, but to just be able to use it as it was intended, yeah. almost. Um, because even like I'm going to bring up a, a very different example, though they are still too similar in a way. Uh, it's with. The new 3DS. Uh, I I don't know if you remember when that came out, uh, but they they released it around two hundred dollars. But the catch is that even though it is a nicer, more upgraded version of the 3DS, now it doesn't come with a charging brick because they're assuming that you're upgrading from the old uh, 3DS. Right. Yeah. So that's just an excuse. <laughs> even th I'll be honest with you. Even then, like not to be all Nintendo Defense Force here, because I don't like people who always do that a lot. Nintendo has made several mistakes in the past, especially software stuff. We'll probably get into that eventually on this show. But um, even with that one, though, like I'm pretty sure, didn't the 3DS in general use the exact same charging brick and port as the DSi? So like, if the, if the, new, if the new 3DS is, in fact, your very first device, then that's, that's awful. It's awful. But like, if you are even just transferring over from like the DSi or the DSi XL to the new 3DS... You probably still have a supporting uh, charging brick. This is a com this is a different story because now we're talking about an entirely new way of charging mm -hmm. that they just spring on you out of nowhere and say, "Oh, you don't need a charging brick." <laughs> we just they're I just assuming that you probably like find an adapter, like a USB C to USB A <laughs> adapter somewhere. It's like I feel like that is uh, Apple's more insidious about it. I do think that it is pretty funny because uh, I I remember back in 2016. When Apple, I would say they were at their peak egregiousness because at this point, uh, they released the iPhone 7 without a headphone jack. Oh, yeah. And they also released the 2016 MacBook Pros, which were the ones with only th Thunderbolt 3 ports, which were just uh, much faster and much more powerful uh, ports in the form of USB-C. Mm. But they were still shipping their iPhones, including the iPhone 7. And the iPhone 8 after it, and the iPhone 10 after it, and the 10R and 11 after it, and the and the 12, uh, well, well, except the 12 actually, yeah, um, uh, with USB A, so you still needed an adapter if you wanted to use your phone, uh, or like if you wanted to charge it on your laptop and things like that. So there still has been that inconsistency with them that and has always bothered me at this point there just has to be an acknowledgement that if you are going into the apple ecosystem you are going to pay more for basic things yes things like, that you shouldn't be paying for like it is you are paying to be inconvenienced so that way you can say you have an apple product yes at least that's the way i'm currently again anti-apple here <laughs> very very anti-apple here right now 
Um, as someone who has used Apple devices, you know, I had the 6S. I also had the 3GS way back then. That was my first smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I'm good with what I have right now. I like the ability to not, like, I like having a headphone jack. I like having mm -hmm. um, a more standard charging, you know, method and port. Of course, of I course. don't know. It's just a really egregious, like, that, that's the word of the day, really, egregious. <laughs> And insidious. And insidious. So we have uh, two words of, of the day, two very happy words. You should name the <laughs> podcast episode that just egregious and insidious <laughs> iPhone practices. I'll, I'll make sure to put it in, in the tags too and in hashtags. Exactly. <laughs> all make, caps. Yeah. All, <laughs> all caps. All caps, yes. And exclamation points and, and a one at the end. All right. <laughs> but Maybe in the thumbnail include a red circle on the iPhone over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's you. iPhone, canceled. But... um. <laughs> We are discussing what's happening in the uh, near distant past. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what's coming up in the near distant future in the other realm of tech. Yes, which is going to be in the graphics card world now. And CPU. And CPU. AMD is really making uh, realms or ruts? Uh, rounds. Rounds. There you go. That's the saying. Realms. AMD is making rounds. AMD is making realms. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, with those graphics cards and that CPU, you know, you can you can run Minecraft realms just fine. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess AMD is. Where's that mute button? <laughs> <laughs> not not <laughs> a worries. You That's shall not be silenced. There we go. Ah, finally yes. making use of that soundboard there. At least, yes. Okay. Besides that one button. <laughs> but yes, I do agree with you. Uh, they're definitely making rounds. Rounds. <laughs> I said it correctly this time, right? As opposed to squares. <sighs> they're making rounds. 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 Good one. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the CPUs are squares, so maybe they aren't making squares. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I knew I would get you there. Anyway. <laughs> AMD is doing really great stuff. <laughs> a little bit of light humor here, but yes, uh, AMD is definitely doing pretty good stuff. Uh, there have been some benchmarks, even with uh, uh, the 6800 XT, which is uh, going to be the direct competitor to the RTX 3080, which is pretty nice. And it actually comes in at $50 less. They also have a 6800, not, not, not XT, that comes in at around, I think, 60 or $70 more than the 3070, and that's mm. the direct competitor to the, 30, to the 3070. Right. And then they have the 6900, which is the direct, <laughs> the direct competitor to <laughs> the 3090. <laughs> and how cheap is it compared to it? Five hundred dollars cheaper. Five hundred dollars, four hundred ninety-nine U.S. dollars. To be exact, yes, off by one penny. Four hundred ninety-nine U.S. dollars <laughs> cheaper. Yeah, and I mean there have been like a lot of really nice benchmarks made in comparison, uh, and they they do seem to be pretty comparable at the very least, justifiable considering the price uh a difference. And when it comes to the sixty-eight hundred XT and the sixty-eight hundred. Especially the XT, I would say that one is is doing a lot better. I think, and certainly in terms you know, of value, and certainly if you if you're in this whole thing for games, you know, surely you have to really be considering AMD at this point, especially with Nvidia having the stock issues that they do. Yes, however, well, you already got your hands on the RTX 3070, so you're you're yeah, good. I'm uh, good. Yeah, uh, so, you definitely don't have anything to worry about. Yeah, no, there. I'm not in the market for an AMD card right now. No. Yes, I mean we've also discussed in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, why I personally can't use an AMD card. However, you mentioned uh, earlier that our mutual friend who is shifting from Maya to Blender can use AMD for GPU rendering because Blender actually supports it. Yes, uh, they use a render method known as OpenCL, yes. which is specifically uh, for AMD cards. So it is actually more convenient to have an AMD card on that, on that end. And uh, since he is making that switch from Maya be due to that, extreme price tag that as as a recent graduate no one can afford yeah uh for maya uh blender being free um it is just at the moment a better option and going with an amd card assuming and hoping even praying that the that there is going to be enough stock because this guy has suffered enough do you think there's <laughs> going to be stock issues like do you think that there's going to be like 
another scalping issue because you have a lot of people who are sort of like looking towards these cards as alternatives to NVIDIA. So like the scalpers start shifting towards them and scalp those two. Like, do you think there's some sort of chain reaction that's about to happen here because NVIDIA ran into the issues that they did? I'm starting to think that there is. Um, hopefully not as intense as it went with NVIDIA. I don't think it's going to be as intense, but it's still going to be present in my opinion. Right. Definitely, no. And so as skeptical as I have been over the last few weeks when it comes to AMD cards and how I'm constantly saying, oh, I have no use for it. I mean, as you mentioned there, you know, for recent college graduates or just people in general who uh, would like to have software that is uh, affordable and, um, you know, attained through more, you know, more uh, legal routes, we'll say. Um, Blender is definitely a great alternative when it comes to 3D modeling software. Like I use Autodesk Maya because I'm, I'm still on my student license. And, you know, because I'm using Maya, I have to use a uh, NVIDIA card. But for a lot of people out there who are trying to, you know, learn these things, do things, do things on a budget, Blender is fantastic because it is freeware. And mm -hmm. yeah, it happens to be able to support AMD cards. So, um, for anyone who has been sitting there on the fence saying, no, I don't know if I'm really going to be getting an AMD card. You know, Chris said that uh, they ain't going to take uh, for GPU. Right? Um, <laughs> if you're going to be using Blender, which is free anyway, so like for anyone out there, I definitely recommend you definitely give Blender a try. Um, I haven't used it in a long time myself, mm -hmm. but the simple fact that it is free uh, gives it a huge one up on a lot of the competition out there. Um, and at that point, if you're going to be using Blender, then yeah, I don't, I don't see why not go with an AMD card for your GPU rendering. Yeah. Yes, there are in fact uh, options in Blender's GPU rendering that are NVIDIA specific, you know, CUDA or Optics. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, OpenGL still gets the job done, at least to my understanding. Yes. Uh, I mean, OpenCL is re really just another rendering method, uh, pretty really? similar to the other ones, but it is just more spe more specific to NVIDIA. Uh, yeah. NVIDIA, uh, I meant to say AMD. I mean, all GPU renders are going to have some level of drawback to themselves. Like Optics, for example, is very experimental and is you know missing certain things, mm -hmm. like for like normal maps or whatever. Yeah. But uh, in general, though, I would say that you are safer with with an NVIDIA card. However, considering the current stock issues, an AMD card is just probably the only option to go but it doesn't mean that it's a bad option to go I mean, by any means but especially especially because we're talking again 499 us dollars cheaper than a 3090 for the top option mm -hmm. um if you are using blender for your 3d modeling or animation needs yeah definitely consider an amd card if you're just in it for video games there's absolutely no reason why you should not be considering amd at this point correct yeah i like, would agree the only drawback that it has in that front is that maybe the ray tracing is a little weaker actually i saw um a screenshot earlier i don't remember exactly from what art article but i did see a, a screenshot where um in the game they did have uh like ray tracing turned on yeah um for in a video card and an amd card and the reflections on that uh uh on on the gameplay sh showing it uh with the amd card seemed a lot more extreme like like the reflections were crazy nice and really? crazy realistic yeah so then yeah definitely if you're going for video games absolutely consider an amd card nvidia yes i mean they did in fact officially announce a 3060 um ti <laughs> ti excuse me they, they you know coming up next will be the 3060 super turbo but uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> of course at this point we're definitely expecting that <laughs> but uh so like i understand they've announced that but you know at that point you're talking like a steep drop down from like your 3080s or your 90s um mm. you may as well look towards the amd cards that are relatively comparable and you know again in the case of those top two examples cheaper one of them significantly cheaper yeah so um, I'm proud to announce that as of now, uh, this podcast will now be sponsored by AMD. As you see, we have the red background over here. Uh, we are going to uh, fight for gamers here with AMD cards. Of course. We've been f foreshadowing this whole thing this entire time with the red lights behind us and the red mouse pad over here and the red record button. So there's just been a lot going on. Please, AMD, contact <laughs> us. You know, we'll we'll shell out for you. <laughs> we'll shell out, especially if you have some free stuff. Which, speaking of possible free stuff, that'd be really nice to have. The very near future, this week, they're dropping their new CPUs. Yes. I've been talking about it for the last couple of weeks now, the last few episodes. This week, November 5th, brand new CPUs. Mm -hmm. Which one are you getting? Oh, top model, obviously. Which one is it? 
whose numbers I completely forgot the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's a 5950X. Ah, uh, gotcha. Oh, okay, so like not not quite a thread ripper, but almost there. Like the step down as, from uh, from the the initial thread ripper. As close as you can get to a thread ripper without it being called a thread ripper. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Not ripping through the threads, but still pretty good. We're 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 certainly cutting, like we're sort of shearing down the threads. Yeah, maybe not ripping them, but like we're, we're shearing them down to their final little little strand there, rising above, I would say. Yes, <laughs> it's, that's definitely what it is. No, it's going to be a fantastic thing. Um, benchmark scores for that particular that particular CPU, the fifty nine fifty X, at least the alleged benchmarks that we saw that you know got removed at the point, they were off the charts. Like they were breaking records for performance. It was just a fantastic looking CPU and. You know, for eight hundred dollars, that's you can't really go wrong with that. You know, thread rippers start going way higher, and you know they'll have more cores, but maybe you sacrifice all those extra cores with you know slower clock speeds, which yeah. means more renders. You know, faster render times if you're doing CPU rendering, which you know we we talked about GPU rendering a lot, but CPU is still the reliable, most accurate to what you want choice. Yeah. Um. Although it does take longer. Mm -hmm. You know, while more cores lead to faster render speeds, slower clock speeds means that you have less stability when it comes to active performance. You saw it multiple times in our school, and you remember hear hearing me talk about it multiple times at home, how my computer would completely crash trying to run certain simulations in Maya, things like hair simulation, uh, rigging simulations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's because the clock speeds aren't necessarily high enough to really support that active performance. Um, and, you know, this particular CPU, you know, 5950X seems to be like this beautiful balance between, you know, a really nice clock speed and what I think it was 16 cores as well. So you have good, you know, a good amount of cores to work with CPU rendering. 16 cores, 32 threads. That's insane. Very very nice, honestly. Yeah. Um, and the best part is there's probably not going to be any stock issues. Yeah. There probably will not be any stock issues whatsoever with CPUs. I don't think anyone's going to go... Fingers you know, crossed, of fingers, course. Fingers crossed. I, I realize that uh, <laughs> you know these are some famous last words here, but <laughs> it's entirely possible that I just jinxed myself. But presumably, you're not going to have this sort of weird, fervid frenzy for these AMD CPUs as you would with NVIDIA's graphics cards or even possibly AMD's. Even mm -hmm. AMD's is because, you know... You know, AM, if AMD has any stock issues with their graphics cards, it's because of the sort of residual hype from NVIDIA's cards leading mm. to further stock issues. You're not really going to have that in this instance because NVIDIA does not do CPUs, or at least not very, you know, not any that I know of. The, no, they do, uh, well, they do actually make a Tegra CPUs oh, slash yeah. GPUs, but those are more so for, for like a Nintendo Switch. Like, yeah. like they're not compute, uh, like PC. Exactly. Like CPUs. AMD, AMD's big CPU competitor is Intel, and they've mm. been tripping all over themselves. Oh yes. So they still don't get the idea. <laughs> so it's like it's probably going to be very firmly just a nice, healthy stock of AMD. I'm still going to show up early at Micro Center just to play it safe. <laughs> probably do the same thing I did with the uh, with the 3070 there, but yeah. Um, you know, just really excited about what's coming up for that one because you know once I have that. Plus the 3070. That's basically just the ball is rolling now for the upgrades. That's just a matter of time. That's inevitability. Yeah. Yeah. Like the hard part is done. Yeah. For sure. I mean, again, like you already have your graphics card. I don't think you're going to have any issues getting anything else that you need. Cases, they're always going to be available. Yeah. Uh, RAM, once upon easy. a time, they weren't, but now they are super easy and they're actually uh, cheaper than ever. I I would say. Can't like, wait to get the uh, Corsair RGB strips, 64 gigs. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I, I would envy you for that. Um, I'm actually using, uh, uh, like, no casing RAM uh, on, like, two slots. Right. And then on two other slots, I'm using Viper RAM, uh, w which is, like, a, the cheapest kit of, like, 32 gigs, though I, I do have in total, like, like, 64 gigs on my PC. If I can make a note too, uh, I saw this one earlier. Uh, I saw someone on uh, Reddit again, <laughs> <laughs> again with that who, issue. Uh, who um, went uh, with liquid cooling, and uh, he turned it on only for catastrophic failure. Like it, we're not even talking like a slowly. 
the entire thing just started splurting out blue fluids. Oh, just, like, <laughs> oh it's man. It's like Ecto Cool of a blueberry. It's like, <laughs> like the moment I see that, I'm just, oh, maybe I shouldn't go with liquid cooling this time around. <laughs> like, I'm probably going to stick with fans. I don't know. Because I don't know. Because isn't liquid cooling supposed to be a lot better for uh, overclocking? Because that, that might be a thing I might want to look into doing later. When it comes to overclocking, liquid cooling is more reliable for sure. Uh, air cooling, however, tends to be more uh, affordable and most of the time just as good. Definitely more affordable. I mean, again, with those uh, those uh, very early Black Friday sales that Best Buy is having, you know, you can get liquid cooling for relatively cheap. Again, we were talking a hundred dollars for uh, the two hundred and forty millimeter. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, my concern now is just like I don't trust myself to assemble this thing. And then for it to not just destroy itself over a long period of time with a slow leakage, like yeah, I'd like, rather I'd rather play it safe with the, the fan stops working than the liquid cooling actively hurts my parts. <laughs> Though you could get an all-in-one liquid cooler instead of getting like straight up like the DIY kit with the radiator separate and the tube separate that you have to kind of like. Oh no, I wouldn't with. do that. I wouldn't do that. Okay. Then uh, I think an all in one cooler would still be just fine for you. Like yeah. I, I don't anticipate um, any kind of leakages happening with that mm -hmm. uh, because it's already like pre-built. All you have to do is uh, just plug it in. Yeah. Essentially oh, okay. plug it in. Ah, so that's what it is. That guy was using uh that guy was a, a DIY liquid cooling is basically what you're saying. Exactly. Okay, all right. Yeah, with DIY liquid cooling, the six are way more likely to happen. But okay. with with something like a like an all-in-one uh, liquid cooling system, that's almost almost dummy proof. So. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, fantastic. Yeah, no, liquid cooling is something I'm very new to uh, when it comes to all that stuff. Like I I've, I've been using fans my entire life, and liquid cooling just sounds so nice, <laughs> especially if it's uh, more reliable when it comes to overclocking, which mm. again, could be something that happens in the future. You know, if I decide I need to shave a couple more seconds off my render time, you know, <laughs> I might just overclock the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, do remember that you usually, when you do overclock, it does reduce the lifespan of the CPU typically. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, there, ha there have to be some trade-offs there. And uh, you, you have to make sure that, that the thermals are still okay, that your CPU isn't still running too hot. Uh, like, you you do have to fine-tune it to make sure that you do have the right overclock right. there and that you don't have a CPU that's running too hot for, for your cooler to handle. Right. I mean, if worst comes to worst, by the time it finally fizzles itself out, maybe I can get a Threadripper. Maybe <laughs> a so. <proper> thread <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> Who knows? You know, it's only a matter of time. Hopefully, that's one thing. Um, mm -hmm. This particular machine that I've been using, I don't know if I would really say that it, you know, made its money back on the investment, just because obviously it's been mostly used for learning purposes. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about actual career, actual work purposes, you know, actual yeah. commissions, jobs, things like that. Uh, the obvious aim is to make back the return on investment. You know, we're talking about possibly around 2,500, maybe even a little bit more on this machine is going to yeah. be spent. Just on the parts too, of Just course. on the parts too, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, software is... Mm. Mm, yeah, that's going to be a lot more murky. I mean, <laughs> you know, I still have that student license of my... Uh, yeah, like you can still use that for I, practice purposes. I have, Z, I have ZBrush through yeah. a friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a friend who helped me pay for the license, you know. It was, I'm actually very happy that they uh, managed to help me out with that one. And, you know, we found that third-party website which sells the ZBrush license for a little bit cheaper. And mm -hmm. that was also a nice big help. Um, of course, you know, FL Studio, I already have that built in there already. Uh, things like that, you know, it's just a matter of, actually using it and making money off it you know of course stop working for exposure stop working for passion start working for actual cash i don't think that you should only work for exposure ever although that's just my opinion and i'm sure that a lot of people are going to disagree with that because exposure exposure can be nice but it is still work that you're doing easy rule of thumb you work for exposure for only two reasons it's your friends and you know for a fact that it's a student project that people cannot afford to pay you with Sure. Any other instance, don't. And if you have the time. Time to. As well. Time yes. to. But like, like, say for example, it's like if a big company is coming towards you and saying that they'll pay you an exposure, you know, it's like if you're that big of a company, surely you should be able to afford to pay me. 
you know, yeah. pay your artists. Exactly. And, <laughs> but of course, that's a different tangent. You know, that's not really tech. That's more just uh, business practices. You know, this is not the uh, of course. It's not the business summit podcast. It's the tech <laughs> summit podcast. Um, I mean, we could still talk about that stuff some other time. But for now, I think we're good. I think so. Yep. Yeah, that's in the bag. Uh, big deluxe episode here with two different subject matters. <laughs> Te- technically a little bit more than that with how far we went we went bouncing around you know we didn't oh, even yeah. get to the uh planned obsolescence battle that iphone and you know other you know phone companies have been battling for a while now of course yeah uh like definitely a lot to talk about and we're definitely going to make sure to touch on those on further episodes that's right yeah but until then i want to thank everybody for tuning in come on in uh, remember if everyone wants they can follow everything in the social media over here uh Follow Tech, uh, Tech Summit over here on yep. all of these channels. And uh, yeah, <laughs> continue the plug because clearly I'm not used to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no worries. So uh, yeah, you're, you're going to find everything down below in the description. Also, don't forget that I like to stream on Twitch every Friday and Saturday. If you would like to catch up with that, those are some pretty chill live streams. And also, just make sure to stick around for, for more tech reviews and the, the Tech Summit podcast moving forward. But with that said, have a good one and enjoy. All right. Good night. Travel well. <laughs>